So the season goes on where it's, um, and I don't remember if this was quarters, semis, and finals, or it was just semis and finals back then. Do you remember what that was back in those days in 90? I don't. It was probably, I, I want to say quarters, semis, and finals. Mm -hmm. Was there three shows? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. So this was the Wednesday before quarters. Um, the core wasn't doing great. We were doing okay, but we weren't doing great. We did Carmen that year, I think it was. The, the you know, Bangor had a history of doing Broadway shows that were successful. So they did Carmen that wasn't as successful as far as on the field, at least. Um, and <laughs> the Wednesday night before quarterfinals, Gail Royer let the people who went on individuals and ensembles go do the showcase, which they went and performed somewhere, you know, for people in the middle of town, whatever. And it was the front ensemble, the bass line, the cymbal line. And I can't remember if it was one snare and a tenor, but it was one, if not both, you know. So we're having our last rehearsal before quarterfinals with no front ensemble, no bass line, no cymbal line, and we're trying to work the ensemble. And <laughs> I'm pissed. I'm so upset he let this happen, that he let those members go. Good. I mean, it's, you know, you think about it now. Yeah, whatever. It's great. They should go do their showcase, right? They should show the world what they worked all their individual stuff on. But I remember I was fuming and I'm pacing up and down the front sidelines, you know, at this rehearsal. And Gail stayed back with us. And so Gail was there. And every time he would come up to me during the season, it was usually something not good. You know, when are you going to clean that snare leg? You know, I need to walk away. <laughs> What's up with that tenor left hand? I need to walk away. <laughs> So we're having this rehearsal and all there, all there is is the snares and tenors, you know, and the horn line and the color guard. <laughs> and we're trying to do a rehearsal with a run through without the rest of the percussion section, which is totally bizarre to me. So I was upset. And I remember Gail came up to me during this rehearsal and I see him walking towards me and I'm going, oh God, he's going to yell at me about something about the snare line. He walks up and he goes, you know, Scott, I think you should take over this line next year. I want you to be the caption head. And I looked at him and I went, what? I'm trying to get through tonight. What are you, you talking about 91? I go, stop. I, and, and I was just, I, I, I didn't comprehend what was happening right there. <laughs> it was like, I, I'm trying to get through the next couple of days without us falling apart. And we have no percussion section to even work right now. And I'm like screaming at it, right? And I walk away. And it wasn't until literally after the tour that year. And um, of course he calls me again and says, so what do you think? And um, it was interesting because Mike Moxley also called me, 91, to yeah. come back to the Blue Devils. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Yeah. And um, they wanted me to teach the line, but Fred Sanford was going to write. You know, Fred was going to write the book, and I was going to teach it. Um, I and, remember hearing that. Yeah. And Freddie, I mean, me and Fred, we, we were best friends. You know, his wife was in our wedding, you know, and because Judy and Laura were, were best friends. Um, Fred, if... If it wasn't for Freddie, we wouldn't have got married where we got married because he stood in line for us because we were both out of town to reserve the hall where we got married in. You know, so me and Fred, we would, we would go back a long way. And um, <laughs> I'm going, listen, I love Freddie. I would love to do that, but I want to write. I want to be the guy. And then they said, okay, what if Tom Float writes and you teach? And this is all from Mike, you know, and I'm going, I, I want to be more involved in everything. I want to be more involved in the book. And if you can't give me that. And then he even said, what if Ralph Hardiman writes and you teach? And this is all for the Blue Devils in 91. You know? Wow, that and, would have been... I mean, I'm, talk about scrambling. Yeah, I know. And, I, and I'm going, Mike, no. If you don't want me to do it, then, then you know, if, if I can't have it all and I make the call on who's doing what, then I, I don't want to do it. And he goes, okay, well, we'll get back to you. <laughs> and I remember I was home going, okay, Gil Royer is saying, here's the keys of the car. It's all yours. Do whatever you want with it. And the Blue Devils are saying, yeah, we want you to be involved again, but we weren't sure what we're going to do. And, and so I called Gail and I said, yep, I'm in. Let's go. And so 91 was my first caption head year with, you know, Santa Clara in the 91 season. What, I, how amazing or, and what a, what a crazy coincidence that that happens to Float and Ralph the same season. Yeah. And what a massive change that the was. Activity. Absolutely. It, and in, term, in terms of affecting so many careers. Yeah. And in terms of kids, like, I mean, we can, we'll, I mean, one of these days we'll do a podcast about the line that, that may have happened, you know, in 91. Oh yeah. We always, we always talk about that, uh, the, like, uh, the ESPN special, the 1991 Blue Devils. <laughs> but it's, but it, it literally feels like, like, you know, we talked about sports, it literally feels like free agency 
you know, where that particular year, there was a lot of scrambling going on and a lot of people trying to figure out what the next chapter was going to be. Yeah, yeah that's um, very true. Yeah, but, but, but then too, like at Vanguard, you end up taking over for a legend in his own right, Ralph, you know, and, and, and how I, I always thought this kind of fascinating too, the, like the two big guys in the 80, Ralph and, and Tom, they marched together in, in Kingsman, mm-hmm. you know? Yep, absolutely. And you have to, and then you have to step into that. I mean, yeah. and, and there's an emotional component to that too. You Huge. know, I mean, obviously you were just like, I, you know, want to get in and do the job, Huge. but yeah. it feels like the end of an era and that you were a part of, but then also you're going to, you're going to forge ahead, you know, and lay a new foundation. And, and then too, like we talked, we touched, touched up with this, with Murray, you know, you taking over for Ralph, a lot of those guys, they're Ralph guys, you know, and uh, he even <laughs> kind of alluded that he, that, you know, he gave you a hard time and oh, yeah. were those guys, how, I mean, can you talk about that a little bit and how, how, how that tra- transition was for you? The, well, the, yeah, it was, it was tough. I mean, 90 was easier because Ralph was still there. Glenn was still there. You know, I was just, I was helping out. I was kind of a consultant. And then all of a sudden I ended up doing the tour of what I wasn't planning on doing. So the guys kind of like eased into me, you know, cause here's this blue double guy coming over <laughs> you know? and it was literally, I mean, back then it was pretty competitive, you know? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Red versus blue. And then when I took over in 91, it was like, who's going to stick around? You know, and that's also when Ralph started to work with Blue Knights, I think, or was it VK? I think it was VK. No, Blue Knights. VK. Oh, no, yeah. Because I was VK. at VK. Yeah, 91. That was, was Glenn, VK, and, that's right. Glenn and Ralph did VK in 91. So I kept thinking, okay, well, how many of these guys are going to leave and go with Ralph? You know, which I completely understand. I mean, these were Ralph's guys. So um, what we had going for us was um, we had some good drummers, and they knew that I liked beats, and they wanted to play beats, you know, I think. But yeah, it was, it was tough. It was definitely a, a change. Um, we were blessed with the show Miss Saigon that Gil Royer announced because there was a lot of donut holes that the horn line played that, okay, drum line, you create the motion, which I love that. <laughs> you know, yeah, we, I'll give you motion. You know, we'll give you motion. That's not a problem. So it was a good first year for me to be in charge of the book, even though I didn't, I didn't write the whole thing. I mean, I didn't, I've never written the whole book. I've, I, I use everybody around me, you know, the Lee Rudnicki at the time, Kevin Murray. I mean, it was definitely a major collaboration. Was that Lee? I mean, I know Lee March there, but was that his, did you bring him in or how did he get involved or was he there before? Yeah, he did not teach in 90. Um, I brought him back in 91. I knew Lee, he aged out 88, maybe. I think he helped him out in 89 on staff. Um, and I kind of knew Lee and um, I knew he was a wacko enough guy to be with us. So, <laughs> so I brought him in and, and, uh, you know, and that, that was the whole helicopter year. We figured out how to make it drum line sound like a helicopter and all that fun stuff. And it was, it was just, it was one of those years where it was a good year to be a percussion caption head for that particular group, because we were so outside the box with some of the stuff we were doing. We sounded completely different than any other drum line because of the show concept. And it worked. Now, now talking 91, you know, I, uh, we had Murray on and I actually reached out to him and I got a couple questions to ask you Uh-oh. and they're 91 <laughs> specific, you know, uh, the first is, how much fun was it to clean the 91 helicopter pods at uh, Santa Clara? I don't Does that make any sense to you? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, that whole concept came about, I literally went down to an airport where they had helicopters, and I sat on top of my car for a couple of days and listened to helicopters. <laughs> you know, going, how can I get this sound? How can I get something to sound like this? And again, for all you young, and this is before internet and all that fun stuff. So you had to actually go, go somewhere to do something. Couldn't find it on YouTube. Um, and I remember I, I, I brought some ideas back to the guys. And this is, again, we're rehearsing two days a week plus Sundays, you know, from like November on. So you got a whole year to work on stuff pretty much, or six months at least. So I had this concept and I took some old bass heads that weren't on the drum, just the head itself. And I started hitting it going, this sounds like when the helicopter is leaving, when you, when it gets louder, when it's past you, you know? So we start playing on that. Okay, this is cool. Jim Casella, who was in the bass line at the time, he played the number three bass. He, he brought it, he made a wooden box. Cause I told the guys, we need to sound like a helicopter, go home, figure out some stuff, bring back, what do you got? <laughs> you know? So Jim brings back a wooden box that he played with some like bass mallets. And that gave us a whole different sound. And we're able to accomplish that by doing something different with like the low tenor drum on the 14 inch drum. We put like a little pad over there that made it sound a lot lower pitch. And so we 
figured out that if we have these four different pods of the drum line spaced out on the field, when I think we started in the end zone and came towards the 50, uh, four groups. Um, and we just played literally a single pattern and started soft and crescendoed up. And then the other group would pick up that tempo and they would crescendo up and then the next group. So the sound was traveling towards the 50. And it was an amazing effect until Alan Christensen, judging, says, okay, you got to clean that up. And I'm going, clean it up? <laughs> Rut row. <laughs> we didn't think it had to be clean. <laughs> I've never heard a clean helicopter. Well, that didn't work in drum corps. Right? So literally, I remember lying on a picnic bench on the 50-yard line and do it again. Just the low toms, just the drum heads, just the... and we would just try to figure out what do you need to get that same exact tempo and come and clean with that group behind you, you know, because we transferred the sound from group to group. And it was a process all season. It was, I remember in the middle of tour world somewhere and I'm laying on the front sidelines on the 50, do it again, do it again, <laughs> trying to figure it out and giving as much information that we possibly can for the guys to try to figure it out. It was crazy. Well, it, it, it obviously worked because that ended up becoming one of the iconic moments of that show, along with the uh, Excel D cell there at the end of the show. Uh, how hard was that to clean? We put that in at finals. Oh, wow. That was a finals night only? That was learned in one day. Wow. We had like two different endings we were trying to do. And if you remember, right, we pulled out that big um, Saigon flag right at the very end. Um, and we had we needed some more music for it <laughs> compared to what we ended up doing. And it's like, okay, well, let's do a drum thing. Okay, guys, play this. And literally, it was the day of finals. And I, I think I'm right. I think we just did that one show and it was finals. Wow. I, I, stuff you learn, you know. You don't do that nowadays. Nowadays, you don't do that. But back then, it was like, yeah, sure, let's throw it in. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, hey, at least you didn't try throwing in the bottle dance that year, like in 82. <laughs> oh, don't go there. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, for any Vanguard uh, Vanguard people, I'm just kidding. I know that's that could be a touchy subject, you know. And for those that don't know, uh, if you listen to 82, uh, Vanguard, for finals night, they try to put in the bottle dance, and I guess there was an ensemble tear that you can you can hear in the recording and i know why and i can't say why but yeah it, the core was off by a count from side to side <laughs> but the crowd was so loud you couldn't tell this was 82 by the way not 92 but this was 82 so go back a decade for that one yeah so scott let me ask you this is my my other big question i wanted to ask you wait did i answer your first big uh, question yeah okay yeah there's the the one other sort of big question i wanted to ask you um because you have the perspective um, to answer it is, um, what happened, you know, basically referencing what happened in 90 as something that happens, um, to people in this activity, which is, um, you have a period of success with a group, you build a strong identity with a group, and then you part ways for a variety of reasons. It happens for a bunch of different reasons. Sure. You've managed to avoid that. How? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm a nice guy. You know, I like to be, I try to be a nice guy. Um, I don't let stuff get to me. You know, I see guys argue about stuff and I, I'll walk away going, that's stupid. You know, it's not, it's not worth the argument. Um, I guess I'm kind of carefree in that way. Um, I've been very fortunate to last as long as I have in this activity, you know, and I, I think a lot of that's just because of my demeanor and how I act and, you know what I bring to the table still, hopefully. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I lucky the right place at the right time. That was a lot of my career starting and I was in the right place at the right time. Um, you don't have to, uh, mention any specifics, but I mean, you talked about, um, getting disillusioned once, right? Like when you, when you, uh, part of, you know, when you left with, with blue devils, just like with the activity, like you, the way you described yep. it. Yep. Um, was there any other time that, that you were close, maybe? Um, and you don't have to, like, basically describe when, but maybe... Because, because a lot happens in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know? Um, and not everybody does this for as long as you have. Were there, any other, were there any times when you were like, yeah, I either need a break, or I'm done, or I want to go do something else? Um, yeah, but it was... Um when I was teaching RCC 
and when I quit RCC. You know, I ran the indoor line there for 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, maybe, somewhere, I think those four years. But my last year there, um, I was done with doing that. It was, I, there, uh, we had a tragedy in our house and our, our family. My, um, my, my niece, she passed away in a car accident. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was 18 years old. And it was one of those things where I didn't want to not be home if stuff happened again, you know? And it was like, okay, I don't need to do this. I don't need to fly down to LA every other week for four days at a time, you know, and do the rehearsals and all that stuff. So I definitely left, you know, RCC um, purely by choice, just because I, I didn't want to do that, that, that much work or that much travel at the time. Right. It was an extra thing. Yeah. Even though it was great even though it was great and successful. No, it was and fun. And then, and, you know, and to me, it's, it's the performers. When you see the performers succeed, I mean, that's why we do this, right? So that's, you know, and that was a, a huge thing to watch those guys. They, it, was, it was a blast. And the best thing about doing the indoor world was you're, you got complete control. You know, drum corps, there's a lot of chefs. <laughs> there's a lot of chefs in drum corps. And back then in indoor, I mean, the staff was me, Vega, Paul Locke did the drill, and we had a couple other guys. That was it. You know, so it was whatever we wanted to do, whatever I wanted to do and, you know, whatever. So it was like, a, that was, that was, that was a great gig, you know, so to give it up, I had to, it was a, it was a big thing for me to give that up. 